Good morning, Heart Church. It's so great to see you this morning. Welcome to church. Who's ready to praise God this morning? Yeah? Who's ready to worship God? If you're able to, why not stand with me? Who knows that whatever we are have been facing this week, that God deserves praise. He's still worthy. He's still on the throne. He's still in control. And so I want to encourage you this morning as our worship team lead us in praise and worship. I want to encourage you also to contribute your praise and your worship to God this morning. Let's worship. Oh, my 
Yeah, we say worthy. We join with heaven's anthem and we say worthy is the lamb. Let your song just come. Say worthy. God, you're worthy. You're so holy. God, you're so worthy. So grateful, God, that we can come into your presence and join with the angels in eternity singing praise to you. You're so worthy and we adore you, King Jesus. So good to worship together and there's a real sense of God's presence right here and I want to encourage us as as we take our seats that God's presence isn't going to go anywhere and God's going to continue to speak to us throughout the morning but what an honor it is to know that our praise we've been able to contribute our little old praise to the magnitude and the goodness of who God is thank you thank you so much worship team that's great Well, I want to welcome you to church this morning, and I would like just to take a moment. um, It's felt felt a bit cooler here this morning. I don't know what it's been like for your journey in, but my journey into church this morning, I was like, oh, it's it's gone a bit cooler. That must mean one thing. It's the beginning of a new term, and we would love to take the opportunity to mark the beginning of a new academic year, just to take a moment to pray um, over our children, our young people, and over you if you work in education. Down in Adventure Kids this morning, they have Move Up Sunday, which means they all get to go to their next kind of year group and and kind of grow up that little bit more. It also means for our new year sevens that they start Heart Youth this term as well, which is really exciting. But I want to encourage you, if you're a student, if you're at school, at college, going off to university, or if you work in the education field, if you're an educator in any aspect, why don't you just stand with me right now? We'd love to pray with you. If you're standing, then people around you can stretch your hand out to someone who's near you, and you can just pray along with me as we pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for our young people. Father, we thank you for our adventure kids downstairs. Father, we pray your blessing over them. For those of them that are starting school for the first time, those of them that may be transitioning from, uh, from infants to juniors, that, Father, we pray your protection over them. That, Father, I pray that they would have a good story about their school years. That, Father, they would enjoy this time in their life. And that, Father, they would reach their fullest potential. Father, we pray over our young people starting secondary school, over our young people starting college, over our young people that might be moving away to university. Father, again, we speak your protection over them. That, Father, we thank you that you're going to go with them wherever that's going to be. That, Father, every day you're with them in their classrooms. You're with them as they speak to their friends. That, Father, you've gone ahead of them and you're behind them. And we speak out your purposes over our young people's lives, that they would grow up and achieve all the purposes and plans that you have put inside of them. And, Father, we want to pray for these wonderful people, Lord God, that, are, that work in the education field, Father, that are teachers, that are coaches, that inspire the next generation. That, Father, we pray for them, that, Lord God, gosh, their, li- their working week is so full and so busy. Lord God, would they know that you are resourcing them, that you are giving them strength and wisdom and insight to do their jobs, but to also have those moments where they know they are nurturing the next generation, that, Father, that they would go through this academic year knowing that the joy of the Lord is their strength. In your precious name, amen. And all God's people said, amen. Fantastic. Well, also then, as you're taking your seats, Heart Youth Co., this is your time to go out and enjoy the rest of your morning. So if you're a new year seven, then if you want to follow this crew down here, then you can go and enjoy the rest of your morning together. That's great. Well, if you don't know my name, my name's Tamsin, and I'm part of the team here at Heart Church. And so I want to welcome you to church this morning. If you've been coming for a little while or for a long time, it's great to see you here this morning. If you have been coming for a short while and you're wondering how you can fit more into the Heart Church family, then we would love to help you. So on your way out downstairs, there's a Connect banner. There's a team of people wearing lanyards, and they are ready to answer any questions you might have about what goes on in the life of church and how you can fit in. 
we would love to help you on that journey. And I'd also like to speak to all of us. So whether we've been coming a few weeks or a few years, there's plenty of things coming up this term for us to get involved with in the life of church. One of those things is on September the 29th, we are hosting Mark Ritchie's show, As Seen Near a TV. It's quite funny because he's not been on a TV. He's been near a TV. Do you get it? Oh. Okay, well, I, hopefully he'll do a better job than me on the evening. Let's, let's hope that. But that's on September the 29th in the evening at Kings Meadow Campus. What a great opportunity to invite some people to come along and hear the good news of the gospel. And also, just to put on your radars, at beginning of October, we are starting another Alpha course. And again, these are great opportunities that maybe you're having conversations with a colleague or somebody in your family. And I would encourage you to be brave enough to maybe just ask them. Pray, pray to God and say, God, who should I be having a conversation with? And let's just think the worst thing that can happen is they just go, no. And you go, oh, all right. Just thought it was worth asking. So I want to encourage you over these next few days and weeks uh, uh, to think about who you could invite to come along to those. But before we get to the end of September, we've got something coming up this week that we also would love you to be part of. So this Wednesday, 4th of September, 7.30 in the evening at City Site is Heart Prayer. We know it's really important, don't we, to, to ask, you know, pre present our prayer requests before God and how incredible that is that we get to do that as a family together collectively. So I'd love to see you on Wednesday evening at City Site for Heart Prayer. And then I just want to remind you that next Sunday, we've come to the end of our time here at Albert Hall. So next Sunday, we're going to be meeting back at Kings Meadow Campus, or as we fondly call it, KMC. I'm aware that you might never have been to Kings Meadow Campus before. That's found on Lenton Lane, and the details for that are on our website. But just so you remember, next Sunday, we're not here. We're back at KMC. But we're going to continue in our worship and another opportunity, another expression of our worship is us bringing our tithes and our offerings to God. The ways to do that will come up on the screen. And as we're getting ready to do that, I just wanted to have a moment of real talk with you all, if that's okay. Mark's away, so I thought I'd share something. And that is, is that part of our mortgage is coming to the end of its life. At the end, uh, yesterday, it came to the end of its product life, which meant that we've got to put that part of our mortgage onto a new product, grown up, real talk, grown upping. And um, what's been quite tricky is that the product that we had was a fixed rate for the last four years at two and a half percent. Who knows that in me now trying to find another similar product, no can do. Who knows that I'm now looking to be paying considerably more interest on my that part of my mortgage and so we've been having some kind of big finance talks over the last few weeks as we've been sorting out our mortgage and it's been interesting because Mark and I over the years have proven God to be faithful in providing in our finances and so we've had an opportunity that gosh even though these numbers are a bit bigger than we'd really like them to be actually we know that God is faithful God is steadfast and true God has provided for us in the past and God will continue to provide for us. So I wanted to encourage you that maybe your story is a bit like mine or maybe you've kind of payday seems to be getting further and further away each month. But I want to just, just as we bring, as we honour God and bring our tithes and offerings to him, I wanted us to remind us of who God is. In Psalm 90, it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so it's with that in mind that we're able to then bring and give and worship God in our tithes and our offerings. So let's take a moment as we give. Allow me to pray over our offering. Father, thank you that you are faithful. Thank you, Father, that you know what we need before we do. And that, Father, you are faithful to meet our needs according to your glorious riches. Father, thank you that as we honour you and worship you this morning, that 
But Father, we actually also uh, get to live in your goodness and the bounty of who you are. So Father, we pray you'll bless, bless our tithes, bless our offerings, bless what we have given to you today as, as our worship to you. Amen. Amen. Well, it's really good. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Colossians together and learning about how, what we can take from the book of Colossians to help us grow as Christians. It's also really great that Andrew has spent time to help us, and he's written a daily devotional for us. And I would encourage each one of us to engage with that because it's a great way that we can get a bit more out of what, uh, what, we, what we can, of what he's been teaching us, and how we can grow as disciples. So to find the daily devotionals, you go to heart.church forward slash discover, and you'll find them there to help you. But Andrew has the privilege of starting this series on Colossians this morning, so why not welcome him to the stage? Thank you. Morning, everybody. Oh, afternoon, everybody. Sorry, two minutes. Too late. Um, yeah, so we're going to spend four weeks in the book of Colossians. We're going to do a chapter a week. There are four chapters in the book of Colossians, which makes sense. Um, before we begin, though, it, just let me say a few things before we get into the book. There's, even though we're doing four weeks on just one book, and it's a small little book in the Bible, there's still way more to say from the book than we can possibly do in, in four Sundays. So there's so much that we're not going to be able to say. There's more that we won't be able to say than there is that we will be able to say. So the devotions that go alongside will help. They will go through every single verse of the book and go into a little bit more detail, ask us some questions, invite us to do something with this. But even they won't do everything. But hopefully we can get a good flavor over these four weeks about what, um, what the Bible is trying to teach us. And last year, we in the autumn, we talked through the book of Philippians. Uh, if you were here, if you remember that. And, uh, and I began that series by giving like an introduction to the New Testament and why the letters in the New Testament are so foundational to our faith and so important for us to know. I'm not just going to go and repeat all of that, but uh, on if you want to go listen to that, I, I'd encourage you to. It will help you to put this in the context of where it sits within the New Testament. Uh, I spoke that on the 15th of October, 2023, if you want to go find that message, uh, the first week of a Philippian series, which I begin looking at the New Testament and why these books are so important to our lives. So, Colossians, then, is where we're going to be for the next four weeks. And it's written by a guy called Paul. So Paul is uh, a, an, an extraordinary guy in the Bible. Um, you can read about his life. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see lots is about Paul. But particularly Acts chapter 7 to 9 is where we meet Paul and we see him get his life transformed through the power of the gospel. He goes from being called Saul, uh, persecuting Christians, dragging Christians out of their homes, throwing them into prison just for believing in Jesus Christ. So he meets Jesus, the risen Jesus ascended into heaven, and Jesus Christ gives him the job of taking the gospel out to the world. That is the job that he gets given. It's an important job, and he is given a special grace by the Holy Spirit to teach some of the foundational truths of the Christian faith that would go with us forever. So he writes this letter, or, or a book, but it's a letter written to the church in a place called Colossae. Now, Paul is writing from prison. He is in prison because he is a Christian, and he is spreading the good news of Jesus. He, has, he gets in prison many times in his life because of this, but he's writing to the church in a place called Colossae from prison. Now, Colossae just... For information, if it's helpful for you to place it, it's in modern-day Turkey is where this was. Uh, it's a city that does not exist anymore. You can't go visit. There is no town of Colossae anymore. Uh, but it's in modern-day Turkey. As the gospel is spreading out from Jerusalem, north out into Africa and into Europe, we find that this is where this church is. And it seems that Paul, who is writing, has never been there. So if you read the book, you'll see he is writing to a people. He did not start the church in Colossae. It seems that a guy called Epaphras has started the church under Paul's kind of leadership and authority. And Paul is now writing to this church to encourage them in their faith. And that church would have been, like all the churches at the time, a real mix of cultures and, uh, and sort of pasts and people coming from all walks of life coming into the community together under Jesus Christ. Now it seems in here that there maybe are some Jewish people who 
would have received Jesus Christ as their Messiah, you know, the one who came to fulfill all of the Old Testament. But also the church seems to be like there seems to be a lot of people, which would make sense where it is, with people who are not Jews, who are Gentiles, who are people who have got no history of being God's people, right? Would have just been pagan or irreligious people just living their lives, and now they have been preached to, they've been told the gospel of Jesus Christ, who was not just come to be the Jewish Messiah, but who was the savior of the whole world. And they have received Jesus into their lives as their savior. And Paul is writing to this church that seems to be, we'll see throughout our time over these next four weeks, that seems to be doing well. It seems to be a good church to be a part of. It seems to be a good community that is flourishing in their faith. When Paul speaks to them, he is celebrating what they are doing as well as encouraging them to go deeper. And across the book, we're going to see all of this today, uh, but across the four weeks and across the devotions, we will see that there are some big themes that Paul is trying to and the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate into this church and into every Christian who has ever lived since that we can see. And they are the, 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 the big key things within the book of Colossians that I want to draw out a bit today as we look at chapter one and we'll look at across the four weeks. First and foremost is the reality of who Jesus Christ is. Paul is desperate in this letter to communicate, and I will try today with his words to show us just how important Jesus Christ is, both to creation as a whole and to every single aspect of your life and my life. He wants to try and show how important Jesus Christ is. And then he wants to encourage them that because of Jesus, because of how important Jesus is, he wants to encourage them to grow in their faith. It seems that this is a faith that they are living and he wants to call them to deeper and greater maturity of knowing what the truth is and living out the call to follow Jesus. And that that life of maturity should look like a life that is completely and utterly transformed through the power of the gospel, utterly transformed in thought, in action, in works, in deeds, in every way should be transformed by the power of the gospel and that knows what the truth is and therefore is not tempted to believe something that's a lie or to believe something that offers a different truth to what Jesus Christ said, to what the apostles taught. This is what he's trying to do in this book, all while reminding them of who Jesus Christ is. So that's Colossians as a whole. Hopefully we're going to see that today and across the four weeks. But just to give us a bit of a roadmap as to where this book, where this letter is trying to take us. So before we get into chapter one then, let's just, let's pray. Let's give these four weeks to God before we dive into chapter one. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we, we come to this, to this letter that wasn't written to us but is written for us with open hearts. We come ready to receive the teachings that you gave to your apostles. We pray that you would come and reign in this place, come and reign in our hearts, and come and continue to transform us so that we would look more and more like you. May we find you, may you show yourself to us in more and more incredible ways over these four weeks. We come ready to see you, to know you, and to worship you more deeply than we have done before. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so chapter one. We are going to look at a section in chapter one. Let me tell you where we're going. I'm going to read a passage of the Bible, then I'm going to break that passage into two halves and really go into detail. Then we're going to zoom out and look at the bit before and after that passage, and hopefully that is going to give us a snapshot of what this whole book is trying to do, and hopefully we can see something that will begin to transform our lives, I really believe, as we look at this book. So... We're going to focus in on, on a section in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. So this is a hymn, this is a, a kind of poetic hymn that Paul writes here to express the absolute enormous significance of who Jesus Christ is. Okay, this is one of those places, there's a few in the New Testament, where we see unveiled the absolute glory and power of who Jesus Christ is, where there is no sort of middle ground within what the Bible teaches to say that, oh, Jesus was a good guy and that's it. No, no, what we're about to see here is Jesus is unlike anything or anyone on the face of the planet. So I'm going to read the whole thing, 
and then I will break it into two halves and we'll go through it bit by bit. But let's read it together to start with so that we can start to see who Jesus is. This is what he says, the Son. So the Son is Jesus, Jesus Christ. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things in, on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Amen. This is Jesus, right? So let me break this into two halves. We're going to talk a lot about Jesus today. We're going to talk about Jesus a lot over the next four weeks, okay? And that's a good thing because we're going to see how incredible Jesus is. So let me break this down. Let's, let's look at verse 15 to 17 first. This, this hymn kind of has two halves to it. So let's look at the first half because the first half is going to show us how Jesus Christ is supreme over the whole of creation, how Jesus Christ is Lord over everything that has been made. So let's go through it. And I'm going I'm to jump in all the time to help, help show us what he's saying here. So Colossians 1.15, the Son is the image of the invisible God. So before anything, Paul is establishing to us that Jesus is not just the best human being who has ever lived. If we put it in an Old Testament context, he's not just a souped up version of Moses or David or Elijah or Jeremiah. No, no, Jesus is God. He is saying the Son is the image of the invisible God. He is the exact, he is God made visible, known to us in the flesh. He is not just the Son of God, he is God the Son. Jesus is God. He is not some demigod. He is not some afterthought in God. No, no. Jesus Christ, God the Son, is God himself. He says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, when he says the firstborn over all creation, he doesn't mean that he is the first created thing. Okay, it doesn't mean that. When he says this, it means he is Lord over all creation. He stands over all creation. So he has sta his status is that it is over everything. See, in, uh, God is the only uncreated thing. Everything else on heaven, on earth, angels, us, the, the, the oceans, the seas, the planet, everything else is created. God is the only one who is uncreated. And here he is saying that Jesus is not the first created thing. No, no, he stands above creation. Because he's God. He is not part of this created world. God the Son, Jesus Christ, is the one who created it. And then he says in verse 16, he goes on, For in him all things were created. So John's gospel opens with a similar thing, saying that everything that has been made is made through Christ. So, you know, in, in our Bibles, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Jesus Christ. Because he's God. He is the one through whom Every single uh, molecule, every person, the ocean, the grass, the trees, the sky, the clouds, the solar system, the sun, the galaxies, the universe, every single thing that has ever existed has been made through Christ. He is the one who made you. He is the one who made me. He is the one who made the air that is the, keeping me alive. He is the one who made it all. And then just to emphasize that point even more, he then goes on to list things that have been created through Christ. In verse 16, he continues, he says, things in heaven or on earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. It's like, can you see, he's trying to make this point. He's over everything. Now, everything I just listed was the earth. He's like, oh, and heaven too. He's the one who made the heavens and the earth. And any kind of power or authority that you can dream of or think of or experience, no, no, he's over that too. There is nothing, nowhere, anywhere that you could find that is above Jesus Christ because he is the one through whom it was all made. It's all made through Jesus Christ. He is the source of all creation. Then he says this, 
all things have been created through him and for him. So not only has every single thing that has ever existed been created through Christ, he's saying the whole of creation actually only finds its fulfillment in God the Son, in Christ. It was made for him, which means even creation can only make sense and only find its place if it is in Christ. It means every single human being on the earth can only find our place and fulfillment in the one who made us, which is Jesus Christ, according to the Bible. He is not only the one who made it, but we can't find our home unless it is in him. And then in verse 17, he keeps going. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Again, he is not in our time. He is not in our space. He is before all things. Anything that has ever been, he is. But listen to this. He's not some God who just lit the fuse and set it all going and then stepped back and goes, I don't care. He says, and, he hold, and in him all things hold together. The whole of creation, every molecule in your body, every galaxy in the universe, every, the solar system that our planet is inhabiting is only being held together, only continues to exist or survive or be sustained because Jesus Christ, the one who started it, the one in whom it finds fulfillment, is holding it together. He is active in sustaining creation. You and I would simply not continue to live or exist if Jesus Christ was not holding creation together. Nothing would work. Nothing would exist. Nothing would be here if he was not actively sustaining creation. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is Jesus Christ. This is God the Son. He is unlike anything or anyone the world has ever seen. He is not some great superhero in the great line of people. No, he is beyond anything of our wildest imaginations. He is more powerful, he is more glorious, he is more mighty than anything we could even possibly conceive of. Think about this. When Jesus Christ walked the earth, he performed miracles, right? He made blind eyes see. He made people who couldn't walk stand up and walk. He walked on water. He calmed storms. Unbelievably powerful things that Jesus did. Let me tell you, we, we, didn't, we didn't scratch the surface of the power of God the Son. Right? If, if, if this room could fill all the power that is available that Jesus Christ has, I don't know, maybe the power that we saw will be a speck of dust here compared with what he could have demonstrated of the power that he had. Jesus walking on water, even the human race cannot control the oceans and yet he calmed it. Yep, he's like, that was nothing. I hold the galaxies in place. We only saw the tiniest glimpse of the power of the one who made it, who sustains it, and to whom it finds its fulfillment. This is God. And according to the Bible, this was true before any of us were born. He didn't need me to worship him to make this true. It was true already. In 120 years when none of us are alive anymore, this will still be true. If I believe it, it's true. If I don't believe it, according to the Bible, it's still true. He is still who he is, whether I accept him or not, whether I was born or not, whether I'm breathing or not. None of that makes any difference to Jesus Christ, who is the one over all creation. This is the Jesus that Paul is trying to get us to see. Look how incredible he is. But that's not all. That's the first half. That's the first half of this hymn. As we move into the second half, we see not only is that true, but he is about to show us in the lives of me and you and us, Jesus is not only ruler and king and supreme over creation, But he is also integral and fundamental and the ruler over our own redemption and reconciliation before God. He is the only way for us to find God. Let's keep reading. Let's read on to verse 18. This is the second half. We've just, he said all of that about Jesus Christ. He says, and he is the head of the body, the church. So he is the one from whom us as a community can draw its life and its source is Jesus. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. See, here we get into 
the most incredible way that this is the way that Jesus draws us into who he is. It says he is the firstborn from among the dead. Jesus Christ, and Paul again and again and again throughout this book will talk about the fact that Jesus was willing to bleed and die on the cross in order to take away our sin and that he rose from the dead in order to offer us life eternal with God. So he's saying here that he is, I mean, he literally was the firstborn from among the dead, but not only that, he, in the same way that he was the firstborn over all creation, he is now the firstborn from among the dead. He reigns and rules over death itself in order to bring us to life, right? In order that he might have the supremacy, he says. See, this is where we, the, the, the crux of our faith, the crux of my faith as a Christian is coming from the fact that Jesus raised from the dead, If Jesus raised from the dead, then every single thing he taught, everything that his apostles taught, everything in the New Testament should be the absolute driving force of every moment of my life because that is the moment where he raised in order to give me life. Because he raised to life, the Bible promises us that not only can we receive salvation now, but when I die or when Christ returns, I will be raised with Christ in the same resurrection that he had and to enter eternal life with God. This is the moment where everything changes in the history of the human race is because he was the firstborn from among the dead. And that drew you and I into the story of the one who is over the universe. Verse 19 will carry on, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. So he's reiterating again, this is God, the fullness of God in a human being, Jesus Christ. And through him, verse 20, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Because all of that was to reconcile all things to him. Reconciliation speaks of a, of a, res- a restoration of a broken relationship. You know, God is holy, and when we sin, we are separated from God. And he says all of this was so that he could take you and me with absolutely no way to get to God outside of this, could take us and restore the relationship that we had broken with Almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth, which means that he is is making a way for us to find the fulfillment of who we are as creation because we can only find our fulfillment in Jesus. So the one who is the, the most powerful one is also the one he is saying is at the very center of our lives. Because Paul is showing them that they are part of this story. And again, as he says here, he says, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The reality of the crucifixion for Jesus is so brutal and so painful and so full of suffering. And yet the one who made everything was willing to come to us to bleed and die just so that we could come home to him. The same Jesus Christ. It is all Jesus. If you're thinking about creation, if you're thinking about the universe, it's all Christ. If you're thinking about your life and how you know God, it's all Christ. From the very biggest to the very smallest moment of my life, he is saying it is all in Christ. Jesus Christ rules and reigns over it all. He is bigger than we could ever imagine. He is bigger than even I can put words to. Even Paul's words don't speak to the majesty, the magnitude, the glory, the might of Jesus Christ. Even when he walked the earth and he showed us how he has power over everything, he couldn't express everything. We'll spend eternity probably gazing at the glory and wonder of Jesus Christ when we see him face to face. Because what's amazing is we see it in Philippians chapter 2 as well. I won't read it, but go and read it. Philippians 2 verse 6 to 11, Paul writing to the church in Philippi, he has the same thing where he, that, that, that he, he writes this hymn that speaks of the utter glory and, and the fact that Christ is God. But in the same time, the more we see, just like he does there, he does here, the more we look at how big Christ is, the glory, the majesty, the power, we also see the glory, the majesty, and the power expressed in him dying, bleeding, suffering on the cross in order to bring us home. So the more we focus on how amazing Jesus is, the more we see that he was willing to go through everything for you. Even though he is the creator of heaven and earth, he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to care. Why should he care? And yet, look at, there is no depth that he is not, was not, will not go to, to win you to himself. This is the Jesus that they have received. 
He is supreme over all creation. He is supreme over all of life. And the same Jesus who rules the heavens and the earth is the same Jesus who towards the end of his life wrapped a towel around his waist and knelt down on the floor among some of the creation that he had made and served them, washed their feet, gave everything, hung, bled, and died on the cross for them so that they and we could find fulfillment in him. And then, if we now zoom out of this hymn, because either side of this hymn, the couple of verses before, the couple of verses afterwards, Paul tells them their story. He tells them their story. Now remember, probably most of these people have got no history of being the Israelites. They've got no history of being God's people. Most of these people, they were just just clueless about what was going on until they found Christ. Most of us in this room probably have a similar story, even though we've grown up in a world that knows about Christianity to some level. This is what he says. He is telling them their story before and after he speaks of how incredible Jesus is. So let me remind us of our story, just like he does to them. Verse 13 and 14, just before the hymn, he says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, the story is because of this Jesus, they, we, can, have been taken from darkness, blindness, into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, we've been rescued, rescued from that into this. And it says, and we've been forgiven of our sins. Similar, straight after the hymn, verse 21 and 22, he says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Like, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one who is over heaven and on earth has reconciled you. He has restored the relationship to you. Look at the, look, look at the contrast between in darkness, um, alienated from God, evil behavior, but because of Christ's death, because of Jesus Christ, who is the king of the whole universe, but is also the one who takes our salvation upon himself, our redemption upon himself, because of that, it says now our identity is holy, blameless, without blemish. Like, this is huge. This is the story of the gospel. This is, this is my story as a Christian. If you've been a Christian for a long time, like I have, we should not forget this. This is the story. Without Jesus, we are not holy without blemish before God. No, no, we are far from God, in darkness, alienated from God. But because of Jesus Christ, everything has been changed. He's king over the universe, and he's also king over my life because he's the only way that I can receive life in God. So whether we're talking about the universe, heaven, or earth, or my decisions today, it is all in Christ. It should all be in Christ. And throughout Colossians, Paul will, like, this, this is a moment of worship. You know, we, we, we could sing to Jesus Christ right now, probably for two hours, in glory and wonder of who he is, and Paul leads them to do that throughout this book. He encouraged them to do that, but what he also is so committed for their lives is that their lives would not stop there, but they would then live a life following this Jesus Christ that this would actually transform their lives in every conceivable way, from the way that Jesus taught us to live and the way that his apostles teach us to live throughout the New Testament. He's like, this should not stay here. This should lead your life to change. This should lead your life to flourishing in a way that is written down and, and given boundaries by Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't want to rescue us out of a life of darkness and then for us to go, great, I'm just going to go back and live a life of darkness. There is no fulfillment there. There is no joy there. There is not the peace that we're looking for there. No, it is only found in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, when you think about how big Jesus Christ is, how could any 
culture, how could any philosophy, how could any teaching, how could any idea compare with being as worthy to listen to or follow than Jesus Christ? The Jesus who made the heavens and the earth, who holds your very life together, who is the fulfillment of your life, and who gave everything of what it meant to be God up in order to win you back to him and has gifted you eternal life in him. How could anything of our culture, how could anything of their culture be worth giving your life to, giving your thoughts to, giving your attentions to? This is what he says. He goes straight on. Immediately after that, we'll read verse 22 again. He says, but, you are now recon- you have, but he, now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Now the hope that's held out in the gospel is that Christ is coming back and we will live forever with Jesus. It's that the only way to be with God is, is in Christ. And he's saying, keep growing. Don't go back to a life that you have been rescued from. Don't come to church and hear about Jesus and then go and follow a different way on a Monday and a Tuesday. Don't do that. And later in the book, he will say, don't believe someone who tells you to follow a Jesus that's not the Jesus that either Paul is teaching or that Christ spoke of himself. Don't believe it. Don't follow it. He doesn't want them to, not because he's trying to control them, but because he wants them to live the full flourishing life that is on offer in Jesus Christ. Because look at who Jesus is. How could anything be more worthy of the devotion of your life than the creator of heaven and earth who bled and died on the cross for you? Don't do it. Don't give your life to anything. And as I said at the start, he is speaking to a church that seems to be following Jesus. He's not going, it's all a mess, you're doing rubbish. No, he is speaking to a church that's doing well, that's following Christ. But there is a word of encouragement to maturity. Let me speak that word into us just because we're following Christ now doesn't mean that in 10 years we can't have just slipped bit by bit by bit by bit by bit away from Jesus. If you are stepping into your adult life, don't assume that the zeal of youth will continue when you are 28. No, keep growing, keep investing, keep reading, keep keep digging deeper into Christ. Don't let anything where things don't follow what Jesus has said, get rid of them. Paul will say, don't believe it. Don't buy it. Don't go in for it. Follow Christ. Look at, there's nothing else that's worth your time, your effort. There's nothing that's worth your 20s or your 30s more than Jesus Christ alone because he made heaven and earth. So walk in the faith. Keep following. Keep growing. Keep growing to maturity. Don't start. Dig deeper. Learn more about Jesus. Follow him more closely. You know, our culture today, the air that we breathe, will try and bend us away from Jesus Christ. That is not new. It was the same in here in the first century early church. The cultures of people around will be trying to take us away, whether they are on the fringes of church like it seems like they are here or if they've made it right into your heart. Repent of them. Turn away from them. Follow the only one who is worth your time. Because we're called to live throughout all the good, the bad, the mundane parts of our life, transformed by Jesus Christ. Let's finish by reading. I'd like to read the whole passage that we've read in bits today. So maybe just close your eyes. And as I read this, just, I don't know, pray that Jesus will show himself to you in a deeper way. That something of his life will come into you. Or maybe that he will speak and give you power and strength for those bits of your life. That if you're honest, you know you're following something other than Jesus. That, I don't know, maybe he will speak into that, breathe life into you. And there is forgiveness for you. And there is grace and power. So let me read this and then we'll just, uh, when I finish, we'll, we'll, we'll just stay in a quiet moment as Tamsin comes to lead us in the next part of our service. So I'll read from verse 13 through to 23. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself 
all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Let's just take a moment. I feel there's a moment of response here uh, for us all. No matter how long we've known Jesus, there's always more of Jesus to know. And so I do encourage us all just to take a moment, maybe close our eyes and bow our heads because we're all at different parts of a journey. We all lead different lives and we've all let Jesus into parts of our lives, all of our lives. But I just get a real sense that for us to take a moment and um, one of the things that Andrew said was is that we find our fulfillment in Jesus. And I want us to for those of us who've maybe known Jesus for a while, just to examine our lives and like, Jesus, are you in every area of my life? And maybe this morning there's an opportunity for you to welcome Jesus into that shady area that you try to keep him out of. But we find our true wholeness and our true fulfillment when we let the entirety of who Jesus is into our life. So I'm going to allow you to have a moment, but I also want to speak to people who may be here who are not sure if they are a Christian or not. You're not sure whether you've given your life to Jesus or not, and you would like an opportunity to do that this morning. Well, I would love to pray with you and lead you uh, to, to meeting Jesus. And what that means is very simply, I'm going to say a prayer, and I would encourage you to repeat that prayer inside your heart and your head. And then I'm going to ask you to put your hand up and we're going to put a card in your hand, which is a very simple card, but it will just help you on your next steps. So if you're wanting to meet Jesus for the first time and invite him into your life for the first time, then this is the prayer. Jesus, thank you that you are God. You have created the whole world and yet you know about me, that you care for me, that you gave everything up so that I could have fullness of life in you. Jesus, I'm sorry I've done life my own way up till this point, but I say, Jesus, would you come in to my heart and be my Lord and Savior? Amen. As we keep our eyes closed and our heads bowed, I would encourage you, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, why not be brave and put your hand up after I count to three, and we'll put a card in your hand. So one, two, three. You can put your hand up and uh, our team will come and give you a card. It's great that people are responding to Jesus. Great. Well, Heart Church, let's celebrate as people are finding Jesus this morning. And that's fantastic. We want to celebrate with you. So let's just take a moment. If you are sitting and you've got one of these cards in your hand, we would love to encourage you to fill that out. You can do that either by scanning the QR code, which takes you to a digital format of the the form that's on the other side, or you could fill this one in as well. And we would encourage you to, um, to tell your friends that you've asked Jesus into your life this morning. It's the best decision you are going to make. But we also want to celebrate with you. So we would love the opportunity of meeting you and speaking to you. There's going to be a team of people down at the front wearing lanyards. You can bring your card forward and they are ready to chat with you and answer any questions you may have. And we want to help you on your next steps of following Jesus. And for the rest of us, I want to encourage us that over this coming week, why not engage with the devotionals that Andrew has written? Why not begin to, again, just spend some time focusing on the glory and the magnitude of who Jesus is, and then saying, Jesus, I want the fullness of who you are dwelling in my life too. 
Well, it's been a great morning. Let's show our appreciation to Andrew. Thank you so much, Andrew. And uh, thank you for taking the time to write the devotions as well. We know they're going to be great for us. Well, church is coming to an end this week, but we look forward to seeing you next week. Why not say to the person sitting around you, where are you going to see them next week? Where are we meeting, everybody? I can hear you say it right. We're back at King's Meadow Campus next Sunday. Don't forget. But I'd love the privilege of praying over you um, as we come to our, the end of our morning together. So if you're able to, why not stand and I'll pray a blessing over us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness towards us. Father, thank you that you didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but you gave everything up so that we might know fullness of life. Father, thank you that your presence has been here this morning, but the best news is, is that your presence is going to go with us this week. Father, into the classrooms, into the offices, into our homes, on the factory floor, wherever we find ourselves this week, Father, thank you that your presence has promised to go with us. So, Father, I pray that we would have a great week where we know who we are in you and that, Father, we'd be able to bring worship to you throughout our week. In your precious name, amen. Have a great week, Heart Church, and see you at KMC.